Welcome and good evening to everyone who has joined us this evening for tonight's Aleph program, the fifth session in our series on Jews, Judaism, and the pursuit of social justice. Aleph, the Institute of Jewish Ideas, is a community-wide Jewish learning initiative supported by a community donor through their family fund at the Jewish Community Foundation, co-sponsored by the Mandel JCC and UConn Center for Judaic Studies. My name is Avi Noam Pat. I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut, where I also serve as the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies. Aleph chooses an annual theme and invites the community to join high-level educational programming that connects to the theme. Our 2021 theme is the Jewish roots of social justice. And this year's program has explored the pursuit of social justice as a core Jewish value through lectures, discussion, and cultural events that examine the history of Jewish engagement with social justice from the writings of the prophets to 21st century community activism, along with discussions of socially just ways to talk about Jews, Judaism, race, Israel, and more. As we consider the surge of all forms of racism in our country over the last few years, including the most recent manifestations of anti-Asian racism this week and over the last year, let us consider how the imperative to seek justice requires us to speak out and stand with all those who are persecuted. For those who are interested in viewing previous sessions of the series, they are available on the Yukon Center for Judaic Studies YouTube channel, and I will include a link in the chat at the bottom of the screen. The final session in this year's series will take place on Thursday, May 6th, and will feature Professor Gil Troy of McGill University speaking on Zionism, Israel, and social justice. Tonight's program is also part of a series of real talks associated with this year's virtual Heart for Jewish Film Festival. I wanna welcome all of you who have viewed the documentary film Shared Legacies as part of the film festival. This documentary film, which is really excellent, features interviews with our distinguished speaker this evening, Susanna Heschel tonight, along with prominent eyewitnesses and activists from the civil rights movement, and revisits the crucial historical lessons of black Jewish cooperation in an utterly fascinating and urgent call to action. The film will be streaming as part of the festival until tomorrow. Our final real talk of the festival this year will be a discussion of viral anti-Semitism and four mutations, and will feature the film's director, Andrew Goldberg, in conversation with the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Hartford, David Warren, and it will take place next Wednesday evening, March 24th at 7.30 p.m. Now, I am very excited to introduce our speaker tonight for her lecture on Black Jews and Black Jews. This lecture will explore three intertwined dimensions of relations between African Americans and Jewish Americans, Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement, Jewish memory of the civil rights movement in recent decades and in light of the rise of white nationalism and scholarship on racism and what they might contribute to our understanding of anti-Semitism. Susanna Heschel is the Eli Black Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College. Her scholarship focuses on Jewish Christian relations in Germany during the 19th and 20th centuries, the history of biblical scholarship and the history of anti-Semitism. Her numerous publications include Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, which won a National Jewish Book Award, and the Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany. Heschel has been a visiting professor at the University of Frankfurt and Cape Town, as well as Princeton, and she is the recipient of numerous grants, including from the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and a year-long Rockefeller Fellowship at the National Humanities Center. In 2011 to 2012, she held a fellowship at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. She has received four honorary doctorates from universities in the United States, Canada, and Germany. And she's a Guggenheim fellow and is writing a book on the history of European Jewish scholarship on Islam. I could go on. She's uh, an author of over 100 articles, has edited several books, including Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity, Essays of Abraham Joshua Heschel, Betrayal, German Churches and the Holocaust, and Insider, Outsider, American Jews and Multiculturalism. Uh, she serves on the Academic Advisory Council of the Center for Jewish Studies in Berlin and on the Board of Trustees of our very own Trinity College here in 
Hartford. One final note before I turn the screen over to our distinguished speaker this evening. As she will be speaking, everyone will be muted, but I would encourage you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions, which we will be able to address in the Q&A session after the lecture, and we'll work our way through all of your questions. So please feel free to use the chat uh, to pose your questions to Professor Heschel. So now it is my great honor to turn the screen over to Professor Susanna Heschel. Thank you so much, Avinam. It's wonderful to be with you and wonderful to be back in Hartford where I spent whoops, four wonderful years uh, as a student at Trinity College. And I love going back to visit. I remember Crown Market. I don't know if it's still there, I hope so. Uh, but I, I won't reminisce right now. I'm glad that you were able to see the film Shared Legacies. If you haven't yet seen it, you still have a chance until tomorrow. Uh, it's just won an award. It's a wonderful documentary about the civil rights era that also tries to bring the alliances between Jews and Blacks from that era to a new generation today that often really doesn't know what happened in the 1960s. It doesn't know about that alliance. So it has a great educational function. And it actually, I just learned today, won an award. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be the first of many. So I'm usually asked to speak about Black Jewish relations or about the civil rights movement because of my father's involvement. And I'm happy to do that because I actually grew up immersed in conversations at my parents' dinner table with uh, their friends about the civil rights movement, about Dr. King, about racism. And I also had the, the opportunity and privilege when I was growing up to meet Dr. King several times and other leaders of the civil rights movement. And one thing I want to tell you on a personal level is that those leaders of the civil rights movement have been warm and welcoming to me to this day. They invite me when they have reunions. They embrace me and hug me and tell me how grateful they are for my father's involvement. And I just want to tell you how moved I am by that, because, you know, it's been 60 years and yet they're still grateful and they make a point of expressing that gratitude. And I think that's something very special that um, sometimes gets lost in the history books because during the 60s, there was real training in nonviolence. And that training didn't simply mean don't hit back if someone hits you. The nonviolence training was much more than that. It was a training of the mind and the heart and the spirit, but being a different kind of person in this world about how to relate to other people and how to form alliances, even with the people who who are opposed to what you're doing. One of the things that um, Dr. King would do is to tell Andrew Young when they would begin a project somewhere, go and meet with the white business leaders and talk to them. And he would with some trepidation, but he would tell them, look, this is for both our sakes. That is, you want people to go to your stores and buy what you have to sell. You want your economy to boom. And we want our people to have good jobs and spend their money in your shops. So let's work on this together. And that effort to seek alliances was something that I, I admire. I think sometimes it's missing today in many spheres of our lives. And I have to say also that especially Dr. King's family, his four children, one of them has passed away. Yolanda and I used to give lectures together. But the, the kind of warmth that I received from Mrs. King was something that I really, she felt, she looked at me like family. And uh, that's, that's quite extraordinary. I don't think there's any other sphere of my father's life where people are still to this day so grateful to him and express it with such warmth. So um, I want to talk a little bit about those days. And I also have some photographs that I'd like to show you uh, and try to elucidate what it meant for my father 
and for other Jews to be involved in the 60s in the civil rights movement was dangerous, it was difficult, but they did anyway get involved. But why? And why is it significant? And what's the lesson for us today? But I also want to talk about today and some of the very important and interesting and insightful work that's being published by scholars about racism and about antisemitism and what we have and what I have certainly as a scholar of antisemitism in Germany, what I have learned from scholars of racism looking who look at America, some of the methods and the insights that I think we can bring in the field of Jewish studies from that uh, academic work. And then <laughs> I think uh, there are so many ways in which for many Jews, it seems like a, a surprise to find out that there are so many black Jews living in our communities. So many Jews of color, maybe 10 to 15%. There are Asian Jews, black Jews, Jews from actually in Israel as well. A significant number of Jews in Israel from Ethiopia, from East Africa generally, Jews from, of course, from India, from all over the world. Uh, <sighs> And so now we're beginning to understand what it's like to be a black Jew in America. And that's where the term that I think is sometimes misunderstood, but there's a term called intersectional. Uh, people say sometimes intersectionality is anti-Jewish. Well, it's not. It's just a term that means sometimes two different identities or three come together. And we have to see how complicated it is to be both black and Jewish, maybe also female and deal in the United States with racism, with antisemitism, and also with the violence against women. We all know what just happened in Georgia with the killing of those women. And we also realize, of course, and the I think the Anti-Defamation League has done a great job. We realize just how widespread the white supremacist rhetoric has become according to the ADL, it's doubled in the past year, and how widespread it's become also in terms of the range of people, Asian Americans, Black Americans, Hispanics, Jews, women. I, 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 it's overwhelming sometimes to think about what's happened in this country. I have to say that when I was growing up, when we had discussions of racism, these were not political discussions. They were presented in my home as moral issues. For my father, for my father, racism was the exact opposite of religion. My father met Dr. King in 1963 in January at a conference in Chicago where both of them gave keynote lectures. It was a conference organized by the National Conference of Christians and Jews, an interfaith movement. And by the way, I think the civil rights movement was also an interfaith movement, and I'll say why in a moment. But at that occasion when they met, my father gave a very passionate speech. Some people have said that it's the most passionate speech against racism given by a white person since William Garrison in the 19th century. But he began the speech by saying that the first summit on religion and race, the main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. And he went on to say that it was in some cases easier for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea than for certain Black Americans to cross university campuses. And I'm sure you remember what was going on in the 60s, that Black students were not allowed to enroll, for instance, at the University of Alabama and elsewhere as well. So when my father met Dr. King, they just somehow, they bonded. They felt an affinity. They forged a friendship right away and they started to give lectures together to Jewish groups, to college groups, various places. They would talk about racism. They would talk about the effort to free Soviet Jews. My father was very involved with that, to let Jews out of the Soviet Union. They talked about Israel. They talked about faith, religious faith and the Bible. I think what's so remarkable considering that my father, who was born in Warsaw in 1907 to a Hasidic family, my father studied in Berlin at the university from 
1927, and then he was there when Hitler came to power. My father escaped Europe just weeks before the war began, and his mother and three of his sisters were murdered. So when my father was in Nazi Germany, there were Protestant theologians who were saying that the Old Testament is a Jewish book and has no place in the Christian Bible in Nazi Germany. And so they eliminated it entirely. They didn't read from the Hebrew Bible anymore in church. They said Jesus was not a Jew, Jesus was an Aryan. And they said horrible things about Jews. And I, I've looked at those documents, I wrote a book about it, and I know the kinds of things they were saying. For my father to come to this country as a refugee, and then some years later, he found that the civil rights movement, Dr. King, was making the Hebrew Bible the center, the center of his, of his language, of his lectures, his speeches, that he talked about Moses and he quoted from the prophets and his major speeches. It's interesting, Dr. King did not speak about Jesus or the Sermon on the Mount in his major public lectures. Of course, in church, he was a preacher, but he opened the movement to be inclusive, to be ecumenical. And I think that was extraordinary. I'm struck that there were so many rabbis who got involved. Sometimes their congregations didn't want them to go. There was a, a once a freedom ride of rabbis, Protestant ministers and Catholic priests. And there was a rabbi in Long Island who decided to join. And his, his synagogue president sent him a telegram saying, how can you do this? We have four bar mitzvahs this coming Shabbat. <laughs> but he went. And I think it was also a tremendous act of bravery because you may know that those freedom riders, those buses that were traveling from the north to the south were so often attacked, firebombed, and the passengers were beaten. There was one rabbi in Cleveland, Rabbi Lelyveld, who was beaten in Birmingham, I believe it was, and photographs of him with blood dripping down his head. And so many young Jews, some of whom came from secular families, who became involved in the voter registration efforts in Freedom Summer in Mississippi. And you know that there were three young men, two of them Jewish, one black, who were murdered that summer in Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, by the Ku Klux Klan. It was actually important that there were Jews and there were white people because the fact that there were white people in the South also meant that there were certain government agencies, especially the federal government, that had to pay attention. So when those three young men were missing in Mississippi, the fact that two of them were white meant that actually the FBI took an interest and they started searching for them and searching in swamps for their bodies. And while they did that, they found so many bodies of black men who had been left in swamps, dead, murdered, lynched, but nobody had ever gone after their bodies. But when there were white people involved, then the FBI came down. And that tells us something about our country. So my father, my father's involvement with Dr. King meant a great deal to my father in many levels. But what also meant a lot to the civil rights leaders was my father's book on the prophets. That had actually been his doctoral dissertation in Berlin. And he then expanded it and translated it into English. It was published in this country in 1962. And Andrew Young said that everybody had a copy of the paperback in their hip pocket and took it with them to prison. Dr. King's copy was underlined and dog-eared. I wanted to say a word about that book that meant so much. Just to put this into historical context, in Germany in the 19th century, German Jews, liberal Jews, were very anxious to prove that they were respectable and could be granted political emancipation, equal rights in Germany, that they should be accepted at universities and in professions and civil service. And one of the ways they tried to do that was to say, look how, how ethical we are, how moral we are. 
This is something that many groups seeking equality do. Women who wanted the vote, the right to vote also said, if we women vote, we'll bring a kind of morality to politics in the country. <sighs> I wish. <laughs> so Jews started talking about Judaism as a form of ethical monotheism. That's what they called it. The words of the prophets were about justice. And that, they said, is what represents Judaism. And in fact, there were some, such as Hermann Kohn, a great Jewish philosopher, who said that that ethical monotheism not only represents Judaism, but it's the ideal toward which Germany itself strives. So these were people who flourished in Germany, German Jews. There were many universities. They studied, they got PhDs, medical degrees, law degrees. And they define themselves as ethical people. But you know, on the other side, German Protestants had no interest in the prophets. They weren't interested in this. And in fact, on the contrary, starting in the 1890s, German Protestant scholars began to think about the prophets, describe them as people who were sort of lightheaded and would have hysterical fits and fall on the ground and writhe on the ground that they didn't even know what they were saying. One of the great theologians, Protestant theologians of the 20th century, Ernst Trelch, gave a lecture in December of 1915 in the middle of the First World War. And he said, who are these prophets, Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah? They're country bumpkins. And they come to the urban center and they say foolish things like don't make war anymore. Well, how foolish, how naive, how simple. They, in other words, they rob their own people of the chance to speak up in the name of the prophets, in the name of justice, on behalf of widows and orphans, against corruption in the marketplace, against war, the First World War, against anti-Semitism and racism, against Hitler. They didn't have that kind of theological tradition. And in this country, it was very different. The prophets have always been very important for Protestants in America and especially for the black church. And for my father and for Dr. King, the language somehow was similar. What do the prophets say? Prophets are passionate and scream against injustice. My father once said, you know, there are people who say the prophets are overwrought. They're just too upset. They're hysterical. And he said, but if we call the prophets hysterical, what should we call people who are indifferent to injustice? And my father said in a free country, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And that's in the first chapter of his book on the prophets. Dr. King spoke in very similar language. And what was very clear was that racism was utterly incompatible with being a religious person, Christian or Jew. You can't believe that God is the creator of all people and then treat some people as if they're not. So either, either all are equal or you have to abandon your own religious faith and that's intolerable. Now, during those years in the mid sixties, it were very intense years, there came up another issue, which was the war in Vietnam. And for a long time in my home, my father, who was very concerned about the war in Vietnam, talked at the dinner table about whether Dr. King should speak out against the war. Was it appropriate? What would it do to the civil rights movement, to his relationship with the president, President Johnson, with the Congress? And again, it was a moral issue. And I remember going to school as a child and talking to my friends at lunch and saying, is it the moral thing to do to encourage Dr. King to speak out against the war in Vietnam? And my friends at school who had very different families and homes, didn't really know what I was talking about so much, but the intensity was there. It was something that was weighing, I felt weighing on me something to worry about, to be concerned about. What actually 
turned things was when someone named Seymour Melman brought to the attention of my father and some other clergy evidence that we were committing war crimes in Vietnam. And my father had started an organization called Clergy and Laymen Concerned About Vietnam. And when they saw this evidence, they were horrified. Now, for Dr. King, there were many issues involved. What's the connection between the war in Vietnam and the civil rights movement. Many. For one thing, as he pointed out in his famous speech at Riverside Church in April of 1967, for one thing, there were young black men who had no chance of an education, didn't have the money, and the only hope was to go into the military. And they were being sent to Southeast Asia to fight for the freedom of people in Vietnam against communism when they themselves back home in Mississippi or Alabama, when they back home didn't even have the rights that they were fighting for, for the Vietnamese. There were other issues. One issue had to do with money, the amount of money we were spending on a war in Southeast Asia that didn't have a clear cut victory laid out. We didn't know how. We felt more like something that was a, we were immersed in a kind of a sinkhole and it wasn't even clear whom we were fighting. We were fighting civilians by dropping napalm on them and destroying, destroying their farmland. And that was not a way to convince them to turn against the communists. It was a way of impoverishing them and making them hate us. We couldn't even recognize anymore who were the enemies and who were the simple peasants. Dr. King spoke about the money we were spending in Vietnam when we weren't spending money in this country for decent housing, for health care, for child welfare for people who were going hungry. That was something that I was brought up with. My father was nine years old when his father died and his family was very poor. And as we walked together near our home in New York City, which was right at the edge of Harlem, he would talk always about the connection, his poverty in Warsaw, what that was like and what it was like in Harlem to be impoverished, to go to bed hungry to live in a home that had rats, cockroaches, to have inferior schools, to have no access to health care and medicine when you were sick. In a big country like this. So Dr. King also finally, one more thing that was important, that he and my father felt that this war in Vietnam was poisoning the soul of America, that it was making us a country that we, we didn't want to be and that we shouldn't be, that we were doing something criminal. And when you do something criminal to another person, to another country, even far away, it does something to you too, to your own soul, to be so destructive. Of course, what we were doing in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, was also cleared was very far away. In those days, no one had ever gone there. It wasn't nearby like England or France, and it wasn't European. So there was a racist element to that as well. I just want to uh, mention also, Dr. King and, and my father, demonstrated together. I'll show you some pictures. And uh, right just 10 days before Dr. King was assassinated, he came to speak at a convention of conservative rabbis who were honoring my father. Um, my father had invited Dr. and Mrs. King and their children to join us that year for the Passover Seder. And that would have been something very special. And since Passover is coming for all of us, I want to just mention to you, this is something to think about, 
what would it be like for you, for all of us to have Dr. King at our Seder table? What would we talk about? What aspects of the Haggadah would we discuss with what commentaries? I think it would have been a wonderful occasion. My father felt that it would have been extraordinary for Dr. King to experience a Passover Seder, so meaningful. But I wanna take a few minutes to talk about the present day. I think it's important for us to realize that black Jews come to us in some cases having converted to Judaism and in some cases having been born of Jewish parents or one parent. Some are the children of Jewish slave owners, owners of plantations in the Caribbean. There were Jews who owned thousands of slaves. And whenever there's slavery, there's always rape. There is no such thing as rape if you own somebody else's body. So children were produced and there were also uh, discussions, rabbis discussed what to do with the children. The slaves were converted to Judaism. The children were converted to Judaism. Should they sit with everybody else in the synagogue? Should they be called to the Torah for an aliyah? Should they be taught Hebrew and so forth? All kinds of discussions that took place. There was even, by the way, a prayer in Hebrew for purchasing a slave, which is something that uh, I think for many of us is very disturbing. Um, so some of the Black Jews today may be descended from those people who were enslaved. And perhaps part of our Jewish discomfort at times to recognize Jews who are Black may be because we don't want to face the reality of our own history and our own involvement as slave owners. But it's important for us to do that, to be honest with ourselves. And it's important for us also to realize that a Jew is a Jew regardless of the color of skin. And when I hear stories about a Jew who goes to the synagogue, someone who was in another city and needed to say Kaddish and went to the synagogue to the Daily Minion, and because the person is dark skinned, they said, oh, who are you? What do you do? It was treated very, in a very unpleasant way. That hurts me. And I think that should be painful for all of us, for every Jew. That's not the way to treat another human being. But I wanna also just say, before I show you these pictures, I wanna say something about what we have to learn today. One of the things that um, I think is important for us in the field of Jewish studies is to look at what kind of, what kind of scholarship is being done on the history of slavery in America and the history of racism in America, because we have things to learn. Too often, the history of antisemitism is written with one quotation after another, one text after another, look what people said, and that's important. But what's missing, and what I find in the scholarship on racism, is the impact. What does it do to a person? In other words, people such as Saeed Hartman, for example, people who write about racism toward Black Americans, talk about the trauma of experiencing racism and racist ideology. And Jews tend not to do that for some reason, but we should. We should think about the dimensions of emotions and even of bodily experiences that happen when we're treated in an anti-Semitic fashion. Because anti-Semitism in so many ways functions the way racism does. It's denigrating, it's humiliating. And it's something that people hear, take in, and suffer from. We think, for example, about pogroms. We write a lot about pogroms in Eastern Europe. But one element that should be added to that is the element of, of how it affects us in a bodily way. For example, how does it sound? the noise produced by a pogrom, the sounds that one hears that are retained in memory forever. So these are simply some of the ways of thinking that one can 
in Jewish studies that we can benefit from when we listen to studies and read studies of racism. I want to um, uh, show you these uh, photographs uh, in just a moment, but, but I want to also, as a concluding point on the contemporary, uh, I was in South Africa, I was a visiting professor at the University of Cape Town, and I went back there to lead a conference on the Holocaust, and I was there on a Friday morning in the hotel, and I picked up the newspaper, and there was a screaming headline about a massacre that had taken place the day before in a place called Marikana. It was, um, there was a, so mining was going on, diamond mining. And the miners who were paid very, very little, uh, barely a living wage, were on strike asking for higher wages. And someone called the police and the police arrived and jumped out of their cars and with machine guns, killed all the miners who were demonstrating, holding signs, we want a living wage, just killed them with machine guns. It's something that's become famous in South African history. This was in August of 2012, the Marikana massacre. And recently studies have come out, especially a philosopher in South Africa named Tendai Sitholi has written about this in his book called The Black Register that I think is excellent. And he says, you know, racism is too vague a term in this case. How is it possible for someone in the police wearing a badge of the state representing the government to take a gun and kill innocent people who were doing something that's legal to be on strike, to hold a sign saying we want a living wage peacefully, unarmed, why would someone do that? Are these police murderers? Or is it rather that they look at black people and they don't see human beings? What is going on? And we can ask the same question about the murder of George Floyd, or Eric Garner, and so many others. So one of the questions is whether the term racism is really appropriate or whether we should instead use the term anti-blackness with the sense that for some white people, black people are not human. So taking a gun and killing them is not to commit murder because they're not life, they're not human life. Now that's a horrible thing to imagine, to think about, but perhaps we need to face that, face that as a real problem in our society that after a while you can hate people so much that they no longer are human beings. And I think we as, as Jews and as scholars of the Holocaust see that right away because that's what happened to us. We can see how a human being, a group of people can be so stigmatized and denigrated that they're no longer viewed as human. And so to kill them is not to commit murder in the eyes of the killers. And that becomes then for us now a very serious and very grave problem that we have to face in our society. But, but I, I think when we do face serious problems, it's also good to have some, some sense of, of optimism, of hope. And I think we get that very often from the civil rights movement it was an era of hopefulness and a sense that we had that, yes, we have serious problems, but God has given us the strength to overcome those problems and we can do it. So I wanna just conclude now with some pictures. This is a photograph of my father, Rabbi Heschel. And this is a telegram that my father sent to President John F. Kennedy in the summer of 1963. President Kennedy wanted to convene a meeting in the White House of civil rights leaders. And my father wrote a very strong telegram to him saying that he looked forward to attending this meeting, uh, but he said he wanted the president to do something about racism. 
Everybody talks about it. No one does anything about it. It's like the weather, my father said in the telegram. My father had a wonderful sense of irony. And he said, please demand of religious leaders personal involvement, not just solemn declaration. We forfeit the right to worship God as long as we continue to humiliate black people in this country. I propose that you, Mr. President, declare a state of moral emergency. The hour calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. Here's one of the many occasions my father was with Dr. King. At this occasion, Dr. King was being given an award uh, by a Jewish organization. And here they are gathered in Selma in 1965. Someone had arrived from Hawaii and brought flowered lays for some of the marchers. You see Ralph Abernathy on the left, Dr. King, Ralph Bunch, and my father. You could recognize him with his yarmulke and his beard. When he came home, my father said that a little boy came over to him and said, are you Santa Claus? My father thought that was adorable. Um, in the background here, you see a sign that says Tepper's. That was a department store in Selma. It was owned by a Jew, a white Jew, who was also a member of the White Citizens Council and who was very opposed to Dr. King and the civil rights movement and wanted segregation. The White Citizens Council was linked to the Ku Klux Klan, by the way. And then you see on the far left, a, a nun, a sister from St. Louis. There's a wonderful documentary called Sisters at Selma about a, a convent that flew to Selma for this march. And here they are in the front line. Here's another picture. I showed you the image of Tepper's because I just want to be clear that of course, not every Jew supported the civil rights movement. And here they are on the Pettus, Edmund Pettus Bridge. As you see, it's curved. And you know that John Lewis had led a group of marchers and they, were, they went up the bridge, that was two weeks earlier, and they went to the crest of the bridge and looked down. And that's where they saw the Alabama State Police who then charged the marchers and beat them. And John Lewis was bashed in the head his skull was cracked. And here's simply another photograph. My father uh, and Dr. King often met uh, with reporters, news reporters to talk about their plans. Um, in this case, the man who is leaning forward slightly into the microphone was a pastor in Detroit named Albert Clegg. And what's funny is that in those days, Albert Clegg was considered radical. Why was he radical? because he said that Jesus brought redemption to black people and that Jesus himself was probably black, black skinned, which hardly seems today to be a radical thing to say. And then in April, 1967, Dr. King spoke out against the war in Vietnam, just standing right behind him. You can see the face of Andrew Young and you see Dr. King is making last minute notes on his speech was a very big event. Uh, this is the podium. My father's on the far left. My father had introduced Dr. King. And there's a wonderful documentary about this speech that was made by Tavis Smiley for television that I recommend. But this was a dramatic moment. The next day, Dr. King was attacked in all the newspapers. The war in Vietnam is none of your business. You should be quiet. You're gonna endanger the civil rights movement. And it included, by the way, black leaders of other organizations also attacked Dr. King. A few months later, my father and Dr. King requested permission to hold a demonstration against the war in Vietnam at Arlington National Cemetery. And they were, they were denied permission. So then they said, well, we'll have a religious service. They gathered outside the cemetery the man holding a Sefer Torah is Rabbi Maurice Eisendroth, who was ahead of the reform movement. And if you look uh, just next to him, the man who looks a little bald is a rabbi named Everett Gendler. And you see Dr. King and my father with the beret. They had a, a brief service. My father quoted from a psalm. A psalm, he said, 
Eli, Eli, lama azaftani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here they are still at Arlington. And here is another demonstration. My father is standing next to Dr. Spock, Benjamin Spock, who is a famous child a pediatrician. And behind my father is a, a minister, Richard Fernandez, uh, who is the executive director of clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam and just a wonderful person. And he's the person who organized everything, including Dr. King's speech at Riverside Church. Now here, is the Concord Hotel. Dr. King arrived to give a lecture honoring my father. It was in March of 1968. And here they are. And this is the dais. When I was present at that occasion, and uh, it was after dinner, and uh, there were about a thousand rabbis and their wives. All the rabbis were men in those days. And we went into the auditorium. And when Dr. King came in the room, Everybody stood up and linked arms and sang, we shall overcome in Hebrew. And Dr. King said it was the first time he had heard it in Hebrew. Here they are at a press conference. And the, uh, the man to the right there is um, Wolf Kelman, rabbi uh, in the conservative movement. And there's Dr. King and Everett Gendler. When we received news, uh, I actually heard the news that Dr. King had been shot, but we didn't know how badly hurt he was. And I called my father at his study and told him, and he came home right away. And he was so upset that even though it was the middle of the day, he, he got into bed, he, he thought he might have a heart attack. And then we learned that Dr. King had been killed. And my father left the next morning from Memphis where you see Mrs. King in the middle and Ralph Abernathy and Andrew Young, my father. Mrs. King came to Memphis for the march that Dr. King was supposed to lead that day. And you see the, the children, three of the children. And then my mother and I joined my father in Atlanta for the funeral. Mrs. King asked my father to speak at Morehouse Church, which of course he did and we were all there. So um, I think uh, I don't want to end with the funeral. I just want to end with some words about the prophets. My father's question was, what manner of man is the prophet? The prophet is a person of agony, whose life and soul are at stake in what he says, who is able to perceive the silent sigh of human anguish. And yes, in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. God is raging in the prophet's words. While the world is at ease and asleep, the prophet feels the blast from heaven. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Heschel. I'm going to join you on the screen, if I may. Um, first of all, let's let's just give a round of applause to Professor Heschel or a virtual round of applause for a phenomenal and really inspiring and thought provoking presentation. Um, I wish you were here in person in, in with us in Hartford, but we'll have to make do with this um, virtual visit. Really, really incredible. So thank you for being here. Um, we have uh, about 20, 25 minutes for, for Q&A, and um, I'd like to encourage people to uh, type in questions. There are already some that are starting to come into the chat, and I'll try to keep an eye on them and group some together uh, thematically and, um, and ask you a few questions if, if we can as follow-up to, to your uh, wonderful lecture. So the first question that I want to ask is, is one that actually follows up on where you where you ended um, with the prophets. We started with the prophets and you ended with, with the prophets. And there was a question that actually um, came in initially asking the name of the book, The Prophets uh, by, your, by your father, uh, published in 1962 in English, I think. Um, and uh, so 
I wanted to ask actually the first lecture that we had in this series, which um, was by uh, our colleague, Professor Dina Grant, who's a professor at the Hartford Seminary was on the prophets and the, the imperative of social justice and the writing of the prophets. And, um, you know, in, in Dr. King's speech uh, at, on the mar March on Washington, he cites the prophet Amos and this idea of justice um, flowing like a mighty stream. And I just wonder from your father's perspective and his writings or in what he talked about, was there a particular prophet um, from, from the, the prophets in the Hebrew Bible that he would cite, especially that spoke to him around this imperative of, of social justice that really resonated, those writings resonated with, with the, the activism that he was involved with in this period. That's interesting. I, I'm, I don't think there's a particular prophet that my father would cite over, but you know, there's a mood to each prophet. So Amos is very forceful in condemning war crimes and condemning injustice, speaking out on behalf of widows and orphans. Jeremiah is often in despair and Isaiah is somewhat more optimistic. Uh, so I would say in that sense, the prophets, um, the prophets vary in tone. But I also would say that my father had a, a wonderful sense of irony and, and so do the prophets. You know, when the prophet says, what, you think God wants your sacrifices? God wants you to do justice. And the prophet isn't saying, don't bring sacrifices. He's saying, that you can't do the one without the other. Uh, and my father has that tone of irony also that I think he perhaps, well, perhaps he was imbued with that prophetic spirit and tone of voice. Interesting. Uh, there, there is a question that um, actually came into us from the, the live stream um, mm -hmm. where some, some people are joining us as well um, that asked this question from Rhonda asked, did Rabbi Heschel consider MLK to be a modern prophet? Do you think that, that he saw Dr. King, something in Dr. King in this way? Hi. I think he, he, my father wouldn't say that Dr. King was a prophet. But he would say, where do we hear a voice like the voice of the prophets of Israel? We hear that voice in Dr. King, he would say. Um, and I do, I want to ask you more about, about that, but I also want to want to go back to some of the questions that are coming in this, where do we hear this voice? Because it, it is interesting to think about sort of this period of time and the activism that accompanied this period of time and the, the prophetic voice in a sense that we could see people sort of the, with the cause to social justice. And we're living in this, in this moment now again of sort of a, a passionate movement that um, seems to be rising up um, behind the cause of social justice in particular in this country in the past year. Um, and I, I want to connect that to a question that came in from Joel Lohr, who, uh, president of the Hartford Seminary here in, in Hartford, who asks, who writes, I was moved by your description of nonviolence encompassing a spirit of love. Can you say more about that, sort of your definition of nonviolence, especially as it applies to, to today and presumably to the social justice movements of today? So actually, I think that what was meant by nonviolence, a kind of training in, in love, prophetic love, um, that that's something actually my father found in Hasidism, in the Hasidic world that he grew up in. Not the kind of modern day Hasidism of people who are um, living in, uh, in a very isolated way. My father was very much open to the world and reading books and studying and wanting to know everything. But in this sense, for my father, what was important about Hasidism was the empathy, the compassion, the passion of the heart. And I think Hasidism brought the passion to principles of justice for my father, but it also meant a caring for other human beings, first of all, that was very important. And second, it, it also meant that you can't, you can't be Jewish the way other people are Jewish. Your Judaism, your religious faith, whatever faith it is, has to be authentic to who you are. 
and you have to know who you are or you can't you can't express you can't be an authentically religious person unless you know who you are so there's very much of an inward self-examination study of oneself know yourself understand who you are and who you are uniquely because no two people are alike my father said to me one day when i was i was doing my homework and i i, I suddenly had this great revelation that i have a life and it belongs to me not my parents and i could study anything travel do things and i was so thrilled with this idea that i went to my father and he said yes yes you have a life but what are you going to do with it by which he meant life is not a gift life is a mandate you have to do something with your life do something for other people do something that's responsible and i took that very seriously so what do we do with our lives and that's something that that's the reason we're so proud of the civil rights movement whether we deserve to be or not but we're proud that people stood up for principles that they felt they had a mandate they had to do what was right for a principle for the highest principle of justice and for jews to take a stand on behalf of other people sure we can stand up for ourselves and, and we do and we should but to stand up for other people to enter into an alliance into a coalition coalition you know they used to say in the civil rights era if you're in coalition only with people who agree with you that's not a coalition you enter into a coalition with people who don't agree and then you find some commonalities you don't look for people who are exactly like you and that was true then as well yeah no I, it's it's amazing also to hear you describe this sort of idea of knowing yourself to also understand and appreciate what your core values are to then be able to apply them and that forming an alliance in this sense is not a political strategy um, to sort of situate oneself in a democracy it is about standing up for the rights of others and knowing and understanding that this is a core value that matters to you and that you have to apply in your relations with with others um, and i think also from my father in, in hasidism everything you do even the most quotidian everything you do can be done with refinement with the sense of god being present in this moment and so in hasidism to eat to walk to dress oneself any gesture, the most mundane, as well as praying in the synagogue, davening, making Shabbat, making Pesach, all of these things. But that's why when my father came back from the march in Selma, he said it reminded me of walking with Hasidic Rebbe's in Europe. He said, I felt my legs were praying. And he said that because that's, that's a Hasidic idea. You can pray when you when you sing, when you dance, when you eat, when you talk to someone, everything can be turned into a prayer. It's it's interesting to hear to sort of think about this also as a as an action that you know in a Hasidic sense, right? It's also about achieving closeness to God, right? So that this performance of these actions is also sort of achieving some mystical sense of a closeness to God as well. And I, I wonder if there's a, there's a question in here that um, asks about, you know, in terms of your father's understanding of, of racism, of um, the persecution of, of African Americans, did he understand this as um, sort of a discriminate, you know, coming as someone who had come and seen the, the the sort of what was happening in Europe, and then seeing the persecution of Jews under uh, Nazism as racism that was a form of white supremacy that was persecuting uh, people on the basis of color of skin, was it an understanding that was about uh, having empathy for the suffering of all and seeing all humans as being created in the image of God? Was it about a Jewish obligation to uh, 
um, you know, to uh, welcome the, the stranger? What, or was it all of these? It was all of those. And of course, in Nazi Germany, 1933, 34, 35, 36, nobody knew that Hitler was going to murder all the Jews. No one knew that at the time. People wanted to get out, but they didn't know. And in fact, a lot of young people left Germany and older people didn't think it was necessary. They didn't think Hitler would do anything to them. They were retired, living a nice life, and no one expected this. But my father would ask me, why don't you say something? He told me he, there was a, a library that he would go to run by Jesuits. And he said, why didn't, why don't you speak out? And they said, well, if we speak out, look what they might do to our library. And my father said, can you imagine measuring books against human life? So my father felt also that the opposite of, he used to say this, the opposite of good is not evil. The opposite of good is indifference to be indifferent. And that's what he felt in Germany. The Germans were indifferent, that they didn't see that to persecute a Jew, that it was something for them also, that they needed to be responsible. But you know, the, my father had many friends, refugee scholars, Jewish scholars, and they all thought, you know, Hitler came to power would only last a few months. He was such a despicable person you couldn't and yeah but tell me some other questions yeah i want to get to some of these other questions there's so many that are coming in um there is uh so a couple of questions so one you you mentioned that um your uh father and dr king used to talk about israel and yeah. um we do have a the next session in this series is going to look on um, Zionism and Israel and social justice. But I wonder if you can say a little bit about sort of what those conversations might have been like in terms of um, sort of uh, about about Israel, about the creation of the state of Israel, about the meaning of the creation of the state of Israel. And then we have a question in here that asks about sort of pursuit of social justice and Israel's uh, policy of vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians and uh, and and West Bank and Gaza and sort of how we square this. Um, the, the question asked specifically, you know, is is sort of privileging the idea of the land being sacred is that sort of a form of idol worship, right? And betraying a notion of the centrality, let's say, of social justice that we just talked about in terms of um, the treatment of the Palestinians. So Tell us a little bit about historically what your father and Dr. King might have talked about, if you know, vis-a-vis -vis the vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and then think about the meaning of this for the present day. So my father wrote a beautiful book, Israel: An Echo of Eternity, about the meaning of Israel for Jews. Uh, and in that book, he says, "We do not worship the soil. It's not just the soil, as, for example, uh, Alif Dalit Gordon said, the soil." No, my father said being in Israel, of course, evokes extraordinary memories for us as Jews. It makes the Bible come alive. We know this, but uh, he and Dr. King were in basic agreement. In fact, Elie Wiesel was also uh, that, that there had to be uh, fairness and security on both sides. But I think it's important for people to remember that in the 1960s and early 70s, when the PLO was formed, it made the decision to think about Israel and Zionism as a form of colonialism, given the success of the Algerian revolt against the French. And the problem is that Jews are not the French. Jews are not coming from a country in Europe that they can be sent back to. And it, so the colonialist model doesn't work. And the effort that was made by the PLO at that time was to blow up school buses and hijack airplanes and so on. Uh, and if anything, the PLO was disappointed because after the 67 war, Palestinians on the West Bank weren't particularly interested in the PLO. Uh, they were had new jobs, they were getting good salaries, there was wealth. And so the PLO made a big mistake in the calculation and I think that was, that was terrible. And then the State of Israel made a big miscalculation after the 67 war when many of the government leaders wanted to simply give back territory 
because they didn't want to be governing human beings. Uh, land is fine had it been empty, but it wasn't. So uh, that didn't happen. And this has been going on for too long. Um, I think what's upsetting to everyone right now is the corruption, corruption in the government, uh, as we know, um, and also the, the weakening, the weakening feeling among not only Israelis, but a, in a lot of countries, the weakening sense of commitment to democracy. That's very worrisome. That's been developing not only in Israel, uh, but in many places. So my yeah, father, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you for both providing historical context on, but also, and, and also it's, it's, you know, the complexities of the history and, and also thinking about um, the present day moment and, and sort of attempts to build coalitions around social justice, um, which are still so important. There's a number of questions that have come in on this question of um, coalitions, uh, bringing us to the present day, um, a coalition, a question about a coalition between Jews and Black Lives Matter and um, you know, are there components of the of the BLM movement that might be unwelcoming to Jews? Uh, how do Jews form coalition with those segments? And then at the same way, and I'll put these two together along the same lines, what are your thoughts on the claim that Jews cannot experience oppression in America because of white privilege, right? So, um, and as you talked about, right, uh, sort of complicating the notion of Jewishness and whiteness, but, um, yeah, let's put those two together and then I'll I'll, I'll bring in some more questions. Um, actually, let me just bring, bring in a, a third one that, that is related to this, um, that um, uh, comes in from my colleagues, Sarah Willen and Sebastian uh -huh. Wogenstein, who write that some of here this evening, some of us here this evening are involved as Jews with a very broad interfaith coalition around issues of structural racism and social justice here in Hartford, the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance. One thing that's been extraordinary about this initiative and others like it seem to be emerging around the country is precisely the absence of such coalitions for decades. What are your thoughts on the absence of such coalitions for so long and also the emergence of efforts like our local initiative today? So maybe we can group these together, the, the long absence and then how Jews join into these movements um, in the present day. Yeah, I, so I, I think everybody probably is aware of the book by Mark Dolinger, Black Power Jewish Politics, where he argues that actually in the late 60s, there was an, a nationalist fervor that hit both Black Americans and Jewish Americans. So Jews were not necessarily all that enthusiastically Zionist before the 67 war, but that changed with the war. Uh, before that war, there was absolute terror in the Jewish world that, that Israelis were going to be massacred. Uh, and then there was a kind of hysterical joy and thrill uh, about the war, maybe too much, uh, too much celebration that made us a little bit not as rational in terms of the consequences. Anyway, Meanwhile, black nationalism was thriving, Jewish nationalism was thriving. And what Dollinger describes is we were essentially in the same parallel tracks in the same kind of direction, but we were each doing our own nationalist thing. Thanks to black studies, for instance, at universities, we have Jewish studies. Once black studies was established, we asked for Jewish studies. So we helped each other in that respect. At the same time came affirmative action. And in the Baki case, most of the major Jewish organizations supported Baki against affirmative action, and that became an issue. Now, I personally have to say, there is no such thing as a generic Jew. I'm a Jew, but I'm also a woman. And affirmative action is very important to me because I was seeing a world where women were simply not in graduate programs, not being given jobs, not being taken seriously, et cetera. Affirmative action was very important for every woman in this country who was trying at that time to, to have a profession, to have a career. So the opposition of Jews to affirmative action was a problem first for the, of course, for the black community in America, but also for Jewish women. And, and 
so, but that caused some rift. And there were rifts along the way where I think personally, the Jews overreacted in certain respects. And there were some black leaders who said inappropriate things, but the result of it was in some sense, the tensions and the anger, the resentments and the misunderstandings ended up producing Farrakhan, who was impossible, but he got more attention from Jews than anybody else. And he became a kind of persecuted victim hero in a, in a horrible way. Uh, I also think that we worry about him more than, than anybody else thinks about him. But all right, uh, I think there were alliances and there were efforts that were made over the decades. But now, now it's really become much stronger and more important. And I'm very glad about that. And I don't know the, the project in Connecticut, but I know of other projects elsewhere. And I think they're fantastic. And in terms of Black Lives Matter, it's time for Jews not to, 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 to stop turning our backs if somebody says something critical about Israel. First of all, I've heard things that I, I don't like at all, but I'm a teacher. I sit down and I learned this also from my, from my Israeli colleagues who say, what, you don't talk to someone because they disagree with you? Those are the people you do need to talk to, of course. That's so important. I know in Detroit, there's an extraordinary Black Jewish alliance. But when I met with them, one of the participants um, was an older Black man, told me that he was very hurt when somebody Jewish in the project said to him, well, I don't believe in Black Lives Matter. I believe in all lives matter. And this man said to me, I, you know, I, I took my breath away. What should I say? And I said to him, well, you can tell him in the Second World War, 29 million people were killed. So why should I care about the 6 million? Well, of course I care about the 6 million. And of course I should care about black lives. That's the point. So there are so many ways if we would sit down, we can think things through together. I actually think we can, we can come together. We have so much to help each other with. And I think it's also for reasons that I don't fully understand to this day, but Jews really care about my father's relationship with Dr. King. It means a lot to us and it means a lot to civil rights leaders. And that's something precious and shouldn't be neglected. That can be an inspiration and also a lesson. And Sarah Willen was my student back in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> nice to to facilitate a, a, a teacher pupil reunion and sarah's here I'll, I'll change us to gallery mode before we end maybe she's calling you right now I don't know. um so this this has really been tremendous i want to thank you for a really inspiring fascinating evening and um you know, you give us so much to think about. And as you suggested, as we uh, move towards Passover next week, we can think about, you know, what we might ask Dr. King, um, were he to be at our at our Passover Seder, but also what lessons we can take from what you taught us tonight to apply to the present moment when we think about our second Passover now under COVID, um, but also a time for us to reflect on what's most important in our lives and also a time for us to reflect on what the true meaning of, of freedom is and how we can apply this lesson of, of social justice. May I, may I just leave you with one? Um, Please. Something that I, I read recently. Um, there's a Hasidic commentary by Levi Yitzhak of who was one of my ancestors. The text is called the Kedushas Levi. And he comments on a verse in, in, the, in the Parsha Boil Paro, it's chapter 10, verse one, where God, tells Moses, boil paro, go to, go, but it really means come to Pharaoh, ki because I have, the translation is, I have hardened his heart. And I think we've all heard so often that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But in this commentary, what I, I, I love is that he says, you know, the, the root of the word to harden also is the root of the word for honor, for kavod, for dignity. And if you notice a few verses down, around verse 16 or so, Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, I sinned. 
Now, what Caduceus Levy says is, it's not that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's that God made Pharaoh capable of honor and dignity, of experiencing honor and dignity before God. And that's why Pharaoh said, I sinned. And I think that the idea that one word can mean hardened, or it can mean I gave him dignity, or I made him capable of dignity, that way that the two can go together so easily, I think that that's a beautiful commentary and wonderful for Passover, that sometimes someone might have a hardened heart, maybe we think, and maybe we can make that hardened heart into a heart that actually is full of honor and dignity and love and understands also sin and forgiveness. What a, what a I just had to share that. I yeah. was so moved when I read that. that Amazing. And what a wonderful teaching to leave <laughs> us with as we reflect on that that uh, root of kavod, of, of honor and hardening at the same time. So thank you. Uh, this has really been incredible. I am um, putting into the chat uh, the link to where we will have the video from this evening available and all the videos of the previous sessions of uh, the Aleph uh, sessions on Jews, Judaism, and the pursuit of social justice. I'm going to um, go over to gallery mode so we can see everyone uh, and give you one final round of applause. So thank you so much, <laughs> Professor thank Heschel. You. Thank you. Uh, it's great it's to been be a here. wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who uh, shared your evening with us with Professor Heschel. Uh, the film Shared Legacies is still uh, streaming until tomorrow. And join us for future films uh, at the Hartford Jewish Film Festival, which will continue through the rest of this month. Thank you, everyone. Thank uh, you. Have a good evening. Stay healthy, stay safe, and a happy Passover in, in, uh, in advance. Be well. Be well. Bye-bye.